Hey guys, welcome to our Braxton Happy Hour. We've got some special guests for you here today. Tommy G, Spencer Ritchie, Jimmy McLaughlin, you know them. Let's raise a glass, cheers, and catch up. I miss you guys. It's gross, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Mint chocolate chip is one of my favorite ice cream flavors. Me, me too, graters. Oh, nope. Yeah. Ben Mint said the best girl chocolate chip at graters, though. Oh my gosh, yes, chocolate frozen. I'll Those are the best ones. Just, he is from I will say my favorite candy is gummy bears, but it has to be Haribo. <laughs> it's like the yeah, the, but the cherry ones. Have you ever had the cherry ones? Those are the best. Mm -hmm. The ones that look like mm -hmm. cherries. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They're good. They're good. Mm. We have so much Easter candy in my house right now, and I have like zero willpower at this point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> really, really bad combination. What are the uh, the eggs? Is it Cadbury eggs? Cad those are so gross. Yeah, gross. <laughs> gross. Good. Where did oh, where did Liz go on this love. call? <laughs> Team Mint's falling apart now. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, so Cadbury well, eggs are not not great. I don't know. What? I don't like awful. milk chocolate though. Like that's the weird. I don't like you milk don't? chocolate. So I don't like most candy. Yeah. Like gummy bears, I, I like those. Ice cream, all about that. Sometimes donuts. Other than that, I just, I would rather have like chips. Chips and salsa or something. Mm -hmm. That's not really a candy. No. I know, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't really go for, if I'm going to eat junk food, it's not really like sweet stuff. Have you guys had the peanut butter stuffed peanut butter eggs yet? Oh, that sounds amazing. Wow. Spencer, that's that's for you, man. That yeah. sounds up my alley. I haven't peanut butter. I, <laughs> Reese's I try <laughs> I try not to uh like buy like I try to have like an hour or a half hour of discipline when I'm in the grocery store. Cause if I don't, then it ends up my cabinet and it's gone in a day. So if I can just kind of zone in, maybe I'll get one tree just for it's the trip like itself. A but thing. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but universally peeps are out, right? Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> Super gross. Yeah. Yes. Third grade teacher loves peeps. On a s'more though, it's actually toasted. It's it's not awful. I was gonna say, what about like stale peeps? I've heard people no. like those. Those are weapons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're stale after like being open for twelve hours. It's, it's true. true. <laughs> it's true. You have to consume the entire pack within like an hour or two of of opening them. Otherwise, forget about it. They're fine. I don't know if. You guys are prejudiced against peeps, and candy corn is also <laughs> candy corn is fine. When I was working at a local brewery, the, candy the corn most fun we had was dumping a carton, well, I think it turned out to be 80-something peeps into a chocolate porter, and the most fun was just watching them melt in the beer. I don't know if it made it taste any different, but that was our peep porter. Oh. <laughs> Jimmy, are you still going to the Oakley Kroger and uh, throwing watermelon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's got a girlfriend now. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the watermelon days are behind me. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know. I mean, Did it I'm work? Just... Was that the <laughs> no, way in? It never worked. Literally never. Um, but now I've uh, I've been going to the Fresh Time in Newport. That's my new uh, setup here. I'm, I'm I'm now living in Covington, so it's everywhere. Well, I, I suggest you go back to the Kroger. Yeah, you know, maybe I'll make one more run back there just for. Just to reminisce a little bit, throw a, a couple of <laughs> in there, see what happens. A dangerous, <laughs> dangerous play. <laughs> Anything is dangerous right now. That fresh time has always been a little dangerous because you got all the, uh, as someone who's from Fort Thomas, and we say this, sorry, uh, but you have all the people from Fort Thomas and they're all like the moms in there that are just like, you know, <laughs> you're from around here. So. Oh, nose up? Nose up. Just no. like the the uh, no. soccer moms that are just like, oh, I don't have a day job. My husband makes so much money. And what if they are in this chat right now? I just saw a message on Facebook. Love the Cubs. So watch out. Mm -hmm. Oh, Graders is watching. Man, that's oh, nice. Great. Hey, get some ice cream for the next half the hour. We all will load up. We'll be fat and happy during. Have some ice cream graters. <laughs> I saw on Twitter Mike Lahoud actually requested them send him some graters. I believe yeah. that. I would if I did. There is nothing like actually putting the graters in the yeah. beer with a scoop and oh. Wait, you put ice cream in your beer? 
Yeah, yeah. You put yeah. A, oh, when they when they were at beer fest one year, they had little cups of graters next to the beer samples, and you would put a little bit of the ice cream into the beer. Like a beer. it was fantastic. This is a have you thing. ever? Is it milk stout? Put it in coffee. Like put oh. in. So you have a cup oh, of yeah. coffee, and then you take a, a scoop of vanilla ice cream, and you put it in, and it's like cream and sugar. Yeah, affogato. Coffee side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's good. It's good. good. Hey, Spence, okay. do you have a, a name for the dog? yet um we have a few but we don't want to we don't want to pick one until we get it and make sure it kind of fits the personality on that jazz but we we the three finalists are frederick or fred for short uh carlos or carl and then uh chungus or gus so those are three can you explain uh, these please chungus <laughs> Um, we, we like kind of like weird, like human names. Like I, my dog at, uh, with, that my parents had back home was named George from Seinfeld, George Costanza, things like that, where, um, I don't know, they're kind of funny names. So those are three, we like Frederick, Carlos and Chungus. The Chungus name actually came because the breeders neighbors have some young kids and one of the puppies is a little bit chunkier than the other ones. And these kids named it big Chungus. So um, that's secretly the one that I want to get, but I don't want to get too attached to it in case it's not uh, available when it's our turn. So I'm, I'm team we will see. Oh, no. For real. Yeah. So would you, for sure. how would you go with uh, Carlos if it fits his personality? Is, is it like he's a Spanish speaking dog? Or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just see what, uh, yeah, see what fits. I mean, we could call, we could still call him Carl, which would make it more English speaking, or we can call him Los. Um, then it sounds like so. you're naming him after Carl Lindner. Yeah, it sounds like the owner. You should name him <laughs> Uncle Carl. Uncle Carl. <laughs> Carl, the, Carl the fourth. I'm, my vote's for Carlos, just to be crystal clear. Yeah. I like it's, Chungus. It's, it's my... I like Chungus. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Chungus for sure. we, didn't, we didn't really realize it until, like, last week either. I was just searching Chungus because I don't – I just wanted to see, like, what it meant or whatever. And apparently there was a – in, uh, like, the fat um, – Bugs Bunny is named Big Chungus, and he has like a theme song and stuff. So I've kind of been drawn to Big Chungus since I heard that. So yeah, it's kind of funny. Deep dive. That's amazing. <laughs> Got a lot of time on your hands, huh? Yeah, yeah, just a little. Nothing but time right now. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone who's named two children and decided on the names in the delivery room, you know, you kind of have to see it to. Yeah. You know, just we're not we're not gonna rush it. Wait till the moment. Uh, Jack, they, they didn't share names, did they? Yeah. Did they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were going Arthur for a while, yeah. I guess I just didn't share it with you. No, oh, that shows me where I am. No big deal. I'm just kidding. No, I mean, <laughs> Jack, all the kind words that I sent him uh, uh, yesterday. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I found out Bobby, that I Bobby texted me yesterday and was like, oh, did you hear like Jack had his baby? He already sent me pictures and shit, and he didn't send me anything. <laughs> Speaking of speaking of not finding out uh, vital information. Oh, welcome to club, Spence. Might as yeah, well yeah. So pop another vibe, and you can uh, just. I guess we're old news, and Bobby's the new guy. So. Mm -hmm. but, hey, you know it, it, that's how you find out who you who, who the first love is, right? Like, For sure. Who's the top the favorite list? It's just. I'm sure he's had nothing going on the last 24 hours. You know, he could have at least texted me. Yeah, I mean, he texted me. I don't know. Uh, so, no, I'm happy for him. What kind of questions you guys have? Chime in, uh, you know, send it in the chat. Unmute your line. You're welcome to welcome to chime in. Alex and I'll sit back and enjoy our drinks. And you can ask questions here. Yeah. Go for it. Hmm. Come on, guys. You got to have questions for them. I have no problem. This is my four o'clock hour every day. So. Oh, funny you had posted in the chat earlier, what is your favorite Bailey chant to hear? Jimmy and Spencer. It's mm. a good question. Mm. I love the. Uh, it's from I Jill like the, in the chat. I like the Corbin Bone chant. You know the one where it's like Ole 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 Corbin Bone Bone Bone. That's been a while. It has been a while since we needed to do that one. It's been a while. I've always liked that one. We always had the bone saw. Yeah. 
The bone saw, yeah. The bone saw. You, you know which one I really would love to hear is, I don't know if you've heard the Will Griggs on fire chant. There's like an unbelievable YouTube video of this pub. I think he's a Northern Did you just watch Ireland. Did Sunderland Till I Die or season Ireland. two as well? Yeah, Sunderland Till no, I Die. No, I haven't it's, yet. It's in actually. Sunderland Till I Die season two because Ryan, they signed him there, and there's a lot of uh, yep. that. Yeah. I would love... I would love for that chant to make uh, an appearance with whoever. You can kind of like make a remix for whomever you want, but that uh, Jimmy and I sometimes listen to that song like when we're just hanging out. So for that chant, that chant really little, really uh, gets you going. A couple adult beverages deep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few nights in this chat we can have that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're usually a few uh, beverages deep, so. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, perfect. Work out. Yeah. <laughs> I think those are some of the best pictures that came out of last year were Spencer and Jimmy in the in the March. Oh, that was a fun one. <laughs> those uh, were so good. good. Spencer with the Smurf hands. Smurf. Yeah, yeah, Smurf hands. That blue smoke is no joke. You do not want to be holding that. Yeah. No, that thing blew up like a freaking hand grenade in my hand. It could have been a, a lot worse. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's now you know why we wear masks a lot up front. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to look crazy wearing our masks anymore. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Hey, Anyone make a, an FCC mask? Oh yeah, well we've got our pride. We've made pride buffs this year, and then we're gonna make a. I'm gonna make a few other types of masks. Yeah, we were ahead of the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Up this year. There it is. There, uh, Kim, mm -hmm. DJ have it. Yeah, DJ. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> hey, what about awesome. the trip, uh, stories from the guys? What's that? Any road trip stories? I'm. I'm I'm probably the old guy. I'm in the 50 club here, so I'm probably older than most of the people on the list here. So uh, just as a longtime coach, just hearing stories of, uh, you know, what life on the road, traveling to soccer games on a bus or whatever. Got any good stories? Hmm. We've had a lot of good stories over the years. I remember one from the early USL days. It must have been the first year, and we took a, a sleeper bus – to, I think like Wilmington, North Carolina or something. And they, they picked us up at like 9 p.m. And, and me and Andrew Wiedemann crushed like uh, 20 milligrams of melatonin, like trying to pass out um, on the bus. And like it worked perfectly. We absolutely just knocked out right as we got on the bus, woke up at like 9 a.m. And I guess the bus had broken down and we'd been sitting like an hour outside of Cincinnati for like 10 hours. Um, and we like, we ended up having to drive another 10 hours that day and got like to the game like two hours before it and like had to play in 120 degrees weather. So uh, those early USL days, I think you have some of the craziest stories now. I mean, everything's run pretty smoothly, but those, uh, those first couple of years, things were kind of good to figure it out. Uh, and did Louisville leave one of their keepers at a rest stop? I don't know about that. I mean, I'm, that's definitely possible. Yeah, that, was a, that was a pretty common story. <laughs> did anybody, I don't, I don't know, nobody got left behind in the early USL days, Jim. Omar Cummings did one time. Really? <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we, we had a layover. We, we played in New York, and I think we were flying to St. Louis. And we're at LaGuardia, and like, we had like a delay. So we were at the airport for like four hours, and Big Cat was there with the whole team. And we don't know what happened. He just – we got to St. Louis and he wasn't there. <laughs> Supposedly, he, like, he was taking a nap and fell asleep in the airport and he had to fly in the next morning. But, yeah, he just uh, – he spent the night at LaGuardia by himself. Like, That's the only count. one I can remember. Sound like in kindergarten. Yeah. I think one of my favorite was, was the first year, uh, the 2016 season, when, when Mitch got the red card at New York. And you guys were going straight to Charlotte afterwards, right? There was a midweek game against Charlotte after oh, Mitch the red card in like the tenth minute, and, I and the red card. And Dan Williams was like camping yeah. because he never traveled. <laughs> he was the third goalie, and Dan was in the woods somewhere, you know, <laughs> in, in the mountains camping, and nobody could get a hold of him. He was the third goalie, and they needed him in Charlotte because Mitch was now suspended from the midweek game <laughs> at Charlotte. And I remember that they somehow tracked him down, got him in a car driving, but he had none of his gear with him because he was camping for like five days because the team was out of town. So he goes on, uh, goes on to Charlotte, and in the meantime, somebody overnighted. Somebody went and got in the locker room, got all his gear, overnighted it to Charlotte. By the time it all got there, 
Uh, Mitch's red card. It got retracted. I totally remember that. Oh, I remember my that. God. <laughs> that was like the first uh, ever VAR in like a professional game. I think. yeah, and yeah, it was like, super wrong. Right. Yeah, it was being yeah. tested. Yeah, <laughs> they blew it, and the team, um, while they, while half the club, because of the club at that time had like twenty six employees or something, so half the club was in charge of trying to find Dan Williams and get him to Charlotte. <laughs> right. The rest of the club was wearing. Uh, about about putting the appeal through to get that red card rescinded, which actually ended up being rescinded and Mitch started, and uh, you know didn't didn't make any difference. Hey, Dan Williams' uh, big time performance is being aired this weekend, right? On Saturday night. It is. It is. Yeah, what a game that was. Uh, <laughs> you guys got to show the Valencia highlight too when he runs up for the. Uh, that, we were talking about that today. That's my favorite <laughs> Dan Williams memory. Yeah. No, no one even like like that wasn't no the coaches didn't say anything. He just went like he's like this is my moment. And just <laughs> went to that there. Oh yeah, Absolutely. it was the most. Honestly, it was the most legendary fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> like, for him to come in, make three incredible saves, um, and. And, and put, we made him man of the match on the broadcast. Oh, what a performance. Yeah. yeah. It was remarkable. I remember, too, like 10, 15 minutes in the game, uh, Nico hits a ball. And obviously, uh, Paul Nicholson from England. So, uh, an incredible moment for him. And was this close to uh, force yeah, their yeah. to make a save. And that close to, to putting us up one nothing. So, I think it's going to be fun uh, to relive that moment uh, Saturday night at 6 o'clock on Star 64. Okay. Just announced earlier today. And we're actually going to do a second screen. So we'll be here on Facebook uh, with a chat, and it'll be myself and Kevin McCloskey, uh, Dan McNally, uh, who will be with us. He's the director of soccer ops now, but at the time he was literally embedded with Chris Cross. So he was very much involved in that whole experience. He was with them for four straight days, um, you know, in, in helping them in their experience here in Cincinnati. That went very well, and then Nico's going to join us as well. So we'll have a second screen uh, here on Facebook for that on Saturday night, which should be some fun. Can we get Dan out of the woods for that one, too? I'm, I'm working <laughs> on it. It, it appears to be just as hard to get a hold of him uh, now as it, it was. And I wouldn't be surprised if he is deep in Appalachia somewhere. He's he, not. He's on a social distance better than anybody I think I've ever met. So yeah. he, he might be in the woods, but I'm working on Dan. I, I put up some flares to see if I can't, can't get him on for some of that second screen, because I would love to talk to him about Good. it. He, he's not in Appalachia. He is home, so you should be able to get him. Show, <laughs> Tommy. I already sent up the flare, so we'll see. Yes. <laughs> see if we can't find him. I think he he started getting deal like glove calls, like deals for glove deals uh, after that performance, just because so many people saw it. It was amazing. It was like, wasn't the Valencia match where he came up like at the end on a, a corner, and then ended up having to chase the uh, breakaway like himself the, the whole <clears throat> length of the pitch and like dove like about ten yards short. It was the greatest, the greatest sixty-yard dash from a keeper ever to recover. <laughs> it was a Bailey Legend moment. It was awesome. It was those were his two appearances. Give him credit. I mean, what a guy. Worked really, really hard. Uh, never played in the regulars. Never. I don't know that he really dressed for any USL games because Mitch was never hurt, and I don't remember uh, Dallas. Dallas, really Dallas. Yeah, no, he didn't. What about when Dallas got his red card from the bench? That was. Oh. That was yeah. <laughs> Yo, Yo did as well that same game, right? Yeah, he game. did. Yo and Dallas. Was that in the Guido? Was that Guido Gonzalez Jr.? That was the famous Guido Gonzalez Jr. game. You're right. Uh, yeah, that was a special game. Was that eight eight we total were, cards in that game? Yeah. Kind of, uh, it was Guido 1.0. Like, <laughs> yeah. Wall fall or whatever. It was like shushing right. the crowd. Like, Oh, we did not shush in any way every time he touched it. Yeah. I, I remember when people started thinking we were being mean to him. I know. No, we're like, like, come on, never. guys, let's calm let's down a little bit on him. No. Nope. No. 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 Every time we got the ball, you guys would just scream. Oh yeah, it was just yeah. deafening. Yeah. There was no yeah. chance. There was. I mean, there were, but if he touched it, the chant ended, and it was just yeah, make as much noise. I've never seen the stadium so united in hatred. <laughs> yeah. Well, we think that was the first time we experienced people from the Bailey really throwing stuff on the field because we had some beers and some cans thrown. Mm -hmm. Um, Papa Marshall, who's probably the nicest guy on this chat, was livid <laughs> and was in berserker mode looking for people. Huh. That'll happen. They never appeared again, though. <laughs> you haven't seen them since. <laughs> Jimmy, do you ever um, – who was the guy from uh, Indy who uh, called you out on your uh, goal celebration? Oh, my uh, God. Uh, <laughs> who never played? We ate oh, what was that guy's name? 
Brad Might be lying with Brad me. something oh. or other. Rusin. Rusin. Yeah, Brad Rusin. Yeah, yeah, I don't even know this guy. I, got, I have no idea. Don't we we worry. We took care of it for you. Yeah. Oh, I know. I got absolutely <laughs> hammered. Like, you guys absolutely went off on this guy. So I, I didn't even have to say anything. But he, had, he had songs made about him. <laughs> I didn't even say anything to, like, my face. Like, he was just went on Twitter and, and started, like, talking about me. I'm like, all right, dude. Like, he didn't even play. Talk to me and say something. Yeah. Didn't even play. Forget, forget if you played or not. Here's a really bad idea. Go after Jimmy McLaughlin's dance moves on Twitter. Yeah, it's <laughs> real on soccer. <laughs> Watchful eye. Brilliant. He backed down pretty quickly. Yeah. I forgot all about that. Like, what? What is wrong? With <laughs> that was one of our best away marches. We had, like, uh, oh, that was fun. It was huge. People traveled. At it was least. wild. We had a thousand. We, I we think. destroyed that uh, that bar that they were expecting two hundred. We brought like twelve hundred. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest was we got to the front of um, why can't I think of the stadium in Indianapolis? But uh, Lucas Oil. Lucas Oil. Lucas Oil. We were at the front door and we just stop and we rally everybody and let the whole march catch up. And the ownership is inside with a welcome sign, looking terrified, just <laughs> on the other side of the glass doors. And we rip the doors open and march. And we didn't know we were coming in behind the Brickyard Battalion, and they didn't like that too much. And, no. But that was a great game. There was. Yeah, was inflatable rubber ducks going over our head. There was all kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> Basically, we decided that there's probably going to be a clause written in the USL like handbook and rules that would be like the FC Cincinnati clause: no rubber ducks, no streamers, no, yeah, no, streamers. Uh, no inflatable, <laughs> yeah, wacky, whatever wacky, wacky inflatable guys. guys. Whatever happened with that Louisville streamer like debacle? Like I know oh, the whole people got thrown out. Just mm -hmm. threw out it like was a couple rows or something. Oh, yeah. The first row. Oh yeah. Got thrown out. The first row. Kids, old Kids, people. Grandparents. Yeah, oh, all got thrown out. You guys gave them their best attendance ever, and then they're doing right. that. Like, come on, like have some respect. Right. Conduct like thirty minutes before kick, yeah. and spent the couple of days prior buying out Cincinnati of all the orange and blue streamers in the entire city, hundreds of dollars in streamers. We made a run. We did a lot. We had like five, and they were thrown on towards the end. And one of their one of their fans tweeted like. Great game, guys, but like this isn't okay. And it was like three streamers on the the warning track. They're like, oh, you think that's bad? We're gonna buy up all the streamers, bring them to Louisville. Thirty minutes before, we hear that they added streamers to their banned items. We're like, oh, crap! Like they're all passed out to everyone. We can't stop this. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course, <Got> guys. <laughs> Got some left over. <laughs> they did not like that at all. No, they didn't. <laughs> and nor when we our last bit down there with the wacky inflatable guys that we yeah and we snuck those in we did yeah. not think we thought we were gonna get in trouble and people were just like ha huh? look wacky inflatable guys it's, it's, they're like, doing. they fun. knew we were gone they were like ah just let them do it at this yeah point. we don't have to deal with them next year <laughs> That was a great smuggling operation, by the way. It was. It yeah. was. <laughs> the details of that will remain secret forever. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless you have another beer and they come out here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a secret, secret conversation. Yeah. Hey, how did um, these? These are. This is why you got to tell the stories. Is, you can keep that going on all night. That's awesome. Hey, uh, what about um, when when uh, Kendall Watson played for that other team? Uh, we don't want to mention that name. Uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, I made him my most hated uh, 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 opponent. He, he showed up on the roster uh, at FC, and I was like, oh, my gosh, now I got to like the guy. No, I like the guy. He's an amazing soccer player. How, how did that go in that first time? Because, like, Jimmy, you played against him uh, as your teammate. How did that go that first time when you guys were in a locker room or on the, on the pitch together? Was it like, oh, gosh, like, because he used to be a terror like he was that guy that you wanted to you wanted to go after on the field. For sure. Like I mean, Spencer has always been really good friends with Kendall, and uh, I mean, all, everyone kind of talks about every each other, and, and you know things about players. And I'd always heard, uh, obviously, you don't want to mess with Kendall in practice. He uh, he's going to crush you in any tackle that he gets a chance, and uh, he's also going to slap you if you're on his team and you score a goal. <laughs> Uh, but I also knew he was just like a super nice guy and like a off the field, just a real like gentle giant. So um, I was excited when I saw it. I mean, whenever you have somebody like a, an imposing figure like that on your team and uh, 
you know, he kind of instills fear in, in every other player across the league. He's always a big asset to have. So um, it, it is funny because he is so aggressive and, and strong on the field, but off the field, he's the nicest and kind of soft-spoken guy. So, no, a great addition to the team and an amazing leader for us. Oh, yeah, great addition. Just that he was the enemy, and then he shows up on the team, and you're like, oh, for, was, sure. for me, I was like, oh, crap. Yeah. I, I know. It, it is funny because, uh, like, you – you obviously battle against these guys and it happens all the time. I mean, there's, there's players you play against that you hate, like you hate them when they're on the other team, you know, and then very quickly it, that's all put aside when they're on your team. I mean, I, I'd always been thought and, and kind of been told uh, growing up that you want to be the guy that the other team hates, you know, you want to be the one that nobody wants to play against and you're kind of nasty on the field and you don't make it easy for anybody. And, and those are the guys that you want on, on your team. Um, so it, it can very quickly change from uh, being your, your biggest enemy to becoming one of your best friends, which is, which is kind of interesting about the, the whole soccer side of things. Well, I imagine like when we snagged Aiden Quinn and Kadeem Dakers from Louisville. Yeah. Right. For sure. I mean, right? I, uh, I, I've been friends with Aiden for a while because he, he came on trial with Philly a few times. So even something like that, like me and Aiden were friends, you know, and we're still really good friends to this day. But when I was, playing when we were playing in Cincy and he was on Louisville I mean on the field like you're not friends you know I mean and that, that's just kind of how it goes but when you when you step in between the lines you kind of put all that aside and and you're battling but right after the game I mean we're, we're good friends again you know so it, it's kind of a weird switch that kind of gets turned on and off in, in these certain circumstances I mean obviously there's moments like you know Brad Roos and I guess he's hated me forever or something you know you can't turn the switch off but um, for the most part, I mean, even if it's one of your good friends and they're playing for a rival team, I mean, it's, it's a battle on the field. And then after the fact, you guys can joke around about it. But um, it, it is really interesting because it changes depending on the circumstance and depending what team people are playing for. Yeah, It's so weird, Jimmy, because fans are the exact same way. Because yeah. I, have, I have friends that I've – because, you know, I – went to all the games last year. So I've made a bunch of friends on other that are fans of other teams and we could be friends, but not for 90 minutes. Uh, absolutely. You know, yeah. <laughs> I think it's an agreement that kind of both parties make for that, you know, and then, yeah. <laughs> then, you, then you move on. And right. it's funny, even, at, even at practice, you know, even with our own teammates at practice, I mean, it very often gets kind of heated in a, in a drill or a small sided game or something. And I think, having that competitive environment and, and that attitude is actually overall good for the team. And you, you, you can't be willing to kind of step on people's toes and, and worry about upsetting somebody on, even again with your own teammates. I mean, you kind of get after it a little bit, but then once practice ends, you, you put it all aside and, and it's over, you know? So, yeah. um, so I, sorry, sorry, Jimmy. So no, no, this has been quiet for a while. So <laughs> speaking, so speaking of, yeah, been. yeah. So speaking of center backs, right. So first of all, my favorite Kendall Waston moment is when he did the Homer Simpson celebration for, for his son. <laughs> but, but if you had to choose two center backs to have in front of you, Spence, who would you choose? Cause you've had some really good ones in, in, in forest and in, um, Oh crap. Uh, Australia. Selbridge. Selbridge. Thank you, Harrison. I, I'm, I couldn't think of it. No problem. Uh, but if you got to choose two center backs, who are you going to choose? That's tough. Um, I never played with Harry, so I, it's hard for me to speak uh, speak on his behalf. But uh, someone that I would love, I, I'm not gonna pick the other side because then it's then I'm just getting a little choosy. But um, I would love to see Tom Pedersen um, get a run of games. I really, um, I am I guess a little biased because he's my roommate on the road, my preseason roommate. But um, just in training, I, I I really like his mentality. He's very much like a defend first. He's tough as nails, tackles, um, puts his body on the line. Um, and he's good on the ball as well. He's, you know, he's fearless in terms of, of playing out of the back and even carrying into the midfield and playing uh, penetrating passes. So he is someone that um, that I would love to see get a run in games. And then, yeah, going back to the Kendall, I didn't, I didn't want to, like, speak over anyone, so I didn't <laughs> give my two cents. But, um, no, I, when I got drafted to Vancouver, obviously Kendall was there and and I was going to mention the same point Jimmy eventually made about training is it's kind of the reality, you know, when you step inside the white lines, it's like people become a different animal. You know, some people become pricks. Some people become super communicative that are actually quiet off the field that you just, 
you kind of put on, uh, you know, your, your superhero suit and you, tr you know, try and become uh, as best a player or a teammate or athlete or whatever you can be. So kennel has come a long way that when I first got to Vancouver, um, thank God there was no VAR because he was reckless and he was chewing out referees, F you, F this, <laughs> kicking people when nobody was looking. Um, so he has come a long way in terms of uh, smart physicality and not a uh, reckless physicality. So, um, but as Jimmy said, I mean, off the field, he's like a giant teddy bear, you know? So, and he's like that with everyone. Um, so yeah, an extended answer, but there's my, there's my past like 10 minutes worth of input on uh, the conversations <laughs> that have gone on. I got, a, I got a little more for you, Spence, though. About All right. I, don't, I don't think you were on the receiving end of it last year, but GT certainly was when you were hurt. And it gets a little wound up when you make a big save. And then oh, you man. Slap. Have you been slapped? I don't think you I have, slapped. yeah, quite a few times. Quite a few times in Vancouver as well. Um, yeah, and they'll slap. Yeah. It, it, it's like a borderline concusses you. Like you're you're thinking like if you need to go down for a second, like wait for the trainer, like oh, I need a I need a little. But no, he's a. I mean, he's as passionate and, and as emotional of a guy um, in the league. And you know, to Jimmy's point, well, he's definitely probably top of that list of players that you hate playing against, but you love when you're on. They're on uh, your team, so um, he's a good dude. Would you put uh, Frankie Amaya on that list? It seems like no. off the field, he's no. kind of calm and quiet. But on the field, he he's, it seems like he's pretty uh, pretty ready to go at anybody that crosses the team. He's feisty. He is. He's, he's, a, he's a scrappy dude, but he's got a little bit of an attitude off the field, too. We need to slap that out of him. So um, <laughs> we, got, we got some work to, to do on him. He's got a little uh, sophomore attitude this year. So, um, <laughs> But it's hard for someone – I mean, it's hard for someone – no offense to Frankie, but who's a smaller dude to be a player. I guess Alonzo's not really that big, and people hate him, but love when they're on his team. So, Ozzy Alonzo, that is. But you kind of have to be more of a defensive player, I think, or just like an ob obnoxious flopper uh, if you're an attacking player. Those are probably the only ways you can get on the I hate you list. So, I kind of have a two-part question here. Is the um... – for most of us, obviously, our like our best, you know, our most memorable match was the fire match, you know, in seventeen. And in the PK situation, it's kind of like two parts. of one, Jimmy, for you, when when you buried your PK, like what was your frame of mind going into that situation? And then two for Spence, like when you're uh, when you're you know in goal in a uh, PK situation, how do you want the crowd, the Bailey, to be acting? You know, do you want a choir? Do you want noise? You know, in that situation. Yeah, what a game. Um, I, I mean, going into that game, it, it, it was obviously that we were just so hyped up. No, we can't hear you, Jimmy. Oh, You're no. covering the mic for sure. Jeremy. He's back. He's back. Is it working? I can't, like, put it on my lap. Um, oh, obviously, I stream on Fortnite. Obviously, <laughs> what a game. Like, what what a moment. Um, I mean, even going into that game, like, we were all so hyped up after the, the Columbus game, and obviously everything was kind of building, and then – Somehow we got on the, we knew it was going to be on ESPN. And then we were doing interviews with Taylor Twelman and Adrian Healy before the game. I mean, it was just, you knew it was going to be electric. And um, obviously you're going into overtime. It's uh, the ner everyone's nervous and like, it's, it's a crazy moment. And, and for us, I think we had the advantage because we really just had nothing to lose. You know I mean? We're going out there right. doing the best we possibly can. They're supposed to beat us. Uh, we're playing here at home. I mean, you guys are screaming like crazy backing us up. And uh, I, I mean, honestly, in those moments, you, you're not really thinking much. Um, and you're, you're just kind of playing the game, you know, and, and you're nervous maybe like in between the stoppages and right after the game ends, like obviously going into extra time, you know, in the back of your head, like there's a decent chance here that we're going to go to penalty kicks. And like everyone kind of knows, like if you're going to be one of those guys to take it. Um, and that's kind of the only time you think about it. And then, I do remember the last thing I kind of thought before I, I took my penalty. I mean, obviously the first two guys on each team go and right before I went, Schweinsteiger went. And I, that's the only like conscious thought I really remember before is just like, Oh my God, like that's Captain Schweinsteiger, like world cup winner. Smash the penalty kick down the middle and then smash the ball on the ground before I took it in. Then after that, I mean, your body just kind of takes over. And, uh, I mean, I just remember the craziest uh, just joy and excitement when the ball finally went in. But 
it's it's nerve wracking. I mean, anybody who tells you that they're they're not a little nervous to go take a penalty kick in front of thirty five thousand people uh, with a game on the line is a liar. I, mean, I don't care who they are. I mean, uh, you're for sure always a little bit nervous, but it's the job, and you just uh, trust your instincts and your ability, and your body just kind of takes over. But when Mitch made that save. I don't. I don't. There's there's no moment that's even come close to it. Yeah. Uh, in my life, I mean, just the sound in the stadium and the eruption of the fans and everything, and uh, honestly, just unbelievable. Absolutely. Um, I guess from the other side of that, um, I think more noise the better. You know, in those situations, there the shooter is expected to score. You know, um, so I, of course, you're nervous going into shootouts and and whatnot, but. Uh, I, I prefer noise, chaos, um, all those things. A lot of times with shooters, goalkeepers have a decent idea of where they're going to go just from past, past footage and research and um, stuff that the coaching staff puts together. You know, going into each even regular season game, we'll have their top three or four penalty takers, um, and I'll have a good idea of where they want to go or where they went recently. Um, so uh, noise, prefer noise. We can do that. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'll never forget Schweinsteiger shushing us after he buried his. That was a great moment. <laughs> it was. It, it, like, honestly, like, how cool is that, though, honestly? This guy's great. played at the highest level. Yeah. He's played the World Cup finals. He's won the World Cup, and, like, he still cares that much in a uh, U.S. Open Cup game, you know? Like, and, and he's getting that into it. I mean. Really, for him, Mitch was never staying playing. always going to dive a direction. <laughs> Oh, I know. What a penalty. Just smashing it right down the middle. I, I honestly think that's like the best penalty. I'm interested to see what Spencer says, but you got to have a lot of balls to do it. You know I mean? Yeah. Like you're risking, a, you're risking a lot. I mean, it's, it's a big one, but I really do think it probably has the best percentage of going in. If you like, look at it. I think it takes more balls for the goalie to stay in the middle than it does for the shooter <laughs> to go down yeah. the middle. Cause yeah. if you stay in the middle and they go left or right, you look like an idiot. You can get hammered, yeah. But if you, but if you stay in the middle and you save it, like it's not really that much more sick than if you dive left to right and save it. You know, it's no like added benefit. It's just a lot more risk. But I would do it if that's what the you know the research and if that's what Jack thought was best. Um, but I haven't done it yet. I haven't done it once in my career. Stayed in the middle. Wow. So you're saying there's a chance. There is a chance. There's only one in three. I'm going left, right, or middle. So hopefully, yeah. no one's listening. <laughs> yeah, they're getting yeah, started. Part. We're getting hacked. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, sorry, I was late. I, I got stuck at Jungle Gym shopping. Um, <laughs> I, got, I brought home a lot of meat. I'm pretty excited. Um, I don't know if this was asked or not. Uh, players that were on the USL squad that you wish had come to MLS. Who would you pick one or two? And then I got my second question. Shit. Answer that one first. <laughs> Honestly, I think I could argue a lot. I, I think there was so much talent on the, those USL teams and so many players that are right at the MLS level. And it's interesting because I, I think the difference between an MLS team and, and a top USL team is really at the high end of the roster. I mean, it's the top like one to eight players where it's maybe like a big, big difference. And then um, the bottom are, are quite similar to the top level of USL, especially on those USL teams we had here that were kind of another level um, than, than USL had ever seen. So uh, I could I could pick a bunch, but if I had to pick one, um, I would pick Richie Ryan. I, I think he's a, an unbelievable player who unfortunately didn't play a ton of games here just because of an unfortunate injury. But um, for me, one of the best players I've ever played with in my whole career and a guy who uh, – uh, I really wish got a shot in MLS at some point. Um, this guy, he's a special, special player and, and a guy that you don't really see um, at the MLS level here in America right now with how the league is. Um, just so calm on the ball, so good in possession. Not the fastest, not the strongest, but uh, he's a guy who makes everybody around him a lot better. Answer? Um I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I know this doesn't totally answer your question, but a player that was uh, ended up being signed to the team but that didn't get um, a great opportunity to show himself uh, was Corbin Bone, in my opinion. I thought that he um, – it's, it's a funny business when, you know, maybe you start a game, 
you know, and coaches will say, if you don't play well in that one game, a coach will say, oh, like you, that was your chance or whatever. I don't really think that he was set up um, to succeed uh, last year necessarily, but he was a player, in my opinion, that really made us tick um, three years ago. Uh, in my opinion was, I know Manu had all the stats, but in my opinion, uh, Corbin Bone was kind of what made uh, the team, uh, you know, kind of, kind of the glue, the glue guy, if you will. So he was someone that last year I wish uh, would have gotten more of an opportunity um, to show us stuff. Awesome. Thumbs up. I remember my second part um, <laughs> with, with the club seemingly going towards a Dutch tactical format. A lot of times you'll play a 4-3-3, sometimes a 3-4-3. Has there been any work within a 3-5-2 system that you guys see as being viable for how we're playing with the talent that we have this year specifically? We haven't really worked on the three-back or the five-back um, a ton. I think it's something that, especially with Tom, Kendall, and Mike, that would be super uh, well-suited for at least – I mean, even you throw in Garza, who is more of an attacking guy, uh, you know, Machu is comfortable on the ball. In terms of a back three, a back five, um, I think that was something that would be super interesting to, to put together. Both Mike and Tom are kind of ball-playing center backs. Kendall, obviously, his strength is his physicality and, and being dominant in the air. Um, but it's not something that we spent a ton of time on. The team's, the team's been changing so much as well with um, quite a few new uh, – player acquisitions especially offensively that um it's made it i think a little bit difficult to tinker with some formations but um we haven't worked out in a ton but something i think would be super intriguing that goes to something that i've thought about is like every year it seems you guys have so much turnover just for various reasons because either you're transitioning from usl to mls or changing coaches or building towards the new stadium and it's like each preseason you probably have like a completely new set of guys to work with and a new approach it seems like there hasn't been one full stability transition off season yet what is that like yeah yeah for sure I, I mean I think uh that's kind of the next step to take the level of the the team to where we want to go you know which is make the playoffs and, and challenge for for a trophy. Um, and I think it's going that direction, you know, I mean, obviously these last couple of years have exactly been what you said, transition years and uh, a lot of moving pieces and they're trying to get a lot done quickly. But now that we're really trying to uh, kind of uh, create a culture and a, a playing identity and, and play style that we can build on, I, I think, and I hope that you're going to see uh, kind of more of the same core guys stick around for a long time and, and really build for, for something special. Cause it takes a while to get the chemistry. I mean, it doesn't just happen right away and you need to play with guys for a while. And you look at some of these MLS teams that have done well uh, for a long time. I mean, they keep together the core group of guys and, and it clearly is a recipe for success. So um, I, I'm not the GM. I mean, I, I would assume that that's the way they're going, you know, and, and Gerard's uh, done a fantastic job since coming in. And, and I'm sure that's, uh, that's on his mind, uh, keeping the core together um, and bringing in some pieces to kind of complement that. I would say as well that it's almost equally, if not more important from a tactical and a, and a coaching and a club philosophy that, that there's consistency there because you can kind of bring players in and out um, and, and plug and play them. It's, I mean, to Jimmy's point, you need the core for sure. If you're turning over um, a bunch of starters every year or a bunch of core guys that you expect to contribute, it's going to be super hard. But um, I mean, we've been through, so many head coaches in in one year and two games you know um right and that's that's incredibly challenging for a team especially when last year we were struggling um I felt like guys you know when we weren't playing well we didn't know like guys didn't have anything to hang their hat on that like we were a defending counter team and that's what we did and even when a couple games didn't go our way like we were confident in our philosophy I feel like we didn't have that last year um, and it kind of makes you doubt yourself as a team. And then once the team stops playing well, it makes you doubt yourself as a player. Um, it's difficult. So I think that establishing an identity of a team and who we want to be and how we want to play, how we want to attack, how we want to defend um, is maybe even more vital, in my opinion, um, than, than the roster itself and the amount of turnover. So hopefully, you know, the new head coach will be – uh, sorted soon. I obviously have some time now to figure it out. Um, 
and I mean, in a weird, uh, a weird circumstance, but maybe this whole break, uh, you know, and could end up benefiting us in the end. All right, guys, we, uh, we're wrapping up happy hour. This just got too serious. I know. <laughs> we were on drinking stories and sleep. Come on. I'm over here working happy on Happy hour is way longer than one hour. We, yeah, but it, this thing could get off the rails if we get it. <laughs> I mean, that just got really intense. Like, we gotta, we gotta be careful here. I'll send we're out another serious code. answers here, Alex. This is yeah. No, but I got a good no. question for you. Gosh. We're gonna, <laughs> all right, all right. We're going to wrap it up. We got a good question in the chat box. Okay. I think it's important. Look, we're trying to, oh, right. you know, this this club is building. We're uh, we're we're building uh, youth soccer in the region. And, and Amber over here, she chimed in and said, uh, Spencer, my daughter's a 13 year old keeper. We've been working on her confidence um, because you're her hero. Aww. Uh, and, and and goalkeepers, you know, it's either her feast or phantom, fathom, right? Like you're either getting blamed or you're the hero for making uh, great saves. What 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 is your advice or tricks on building her confidence? I would say um, we had a, a Zoom call with the Cincinnati, the academy goalkeepers last week, and I kind of got asked a couple questions on making mistakes, going into games nervous. Um, you know, I'm not. I've only played 25 games or whatever in the MLS. So I'm not a, a, you know, seasoned vet, if you will. But for me going into games in terms of dealing with pressure and mistakes and success, um, I try to base it on what I have done and that week building up that month building up. Um, have I done what I think needs to be done on the training field? Uh, you know, in my life, sleeping, eating, drinking, all those things. Um, to put myself in a position to play well on the weekend and only you will know that as an athlete you know if you come into the game Saturday and you're like dang I I've been eating good you know training well um, even if maybe you haven't been having a ton of success in training um, have you been doing the things that you can control um, well and I and at that point I think I, if I've done those things then I go into a match on Saturday and I think to myself I deserve to play well today. And that's kind of the mindset that I have um, is to just trying to do everything well that I can. Um, you're not always going to play great in practice. You're not always going to play white great in games, but if you can do the things well that you can control, then you should feel good going into the weekend. You should feel like, you know, you have done your job and the soccer God should reward you with a good performance. And that's how I, um, that's how I deal with confidence and pressure and uh, those sort of things. So that would be my answer. Thank you. That I think is good advice to wrap it up. Amber, you like that? <laughs> Tommy, can we, can we end it with everyone doing a little cheers and get a photo of everyone? This is a virtual happy hour. Of course. Oh, you have to have a oh, virtual make a toast or something. <laughs> wrap oh, it up. Uh, definitely. Hey, it, Come on, Tommy. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to get, uh, get everybody in. Cincinnati. I got to get everyone in here. Let's get a virtual toast. It's good to see everybody. I can't wait till we're back at Nippert. Right? Cheers. Right? So, uh, hey, cheers to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Great to see you. Cheers. Have a good one. See you guys. Thank you. Cheers. See you guys. You, Spencer. Good to see you. Yeah, Bye. likewise. Good to see you guys. Hugging these or what? Bye, Spencer and Jimmy. Finish it off. Bye, Jimmy. Bye. 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 Bye.